Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. No shortage of stories to cover today, not just with Starship's insane progress, but also the first ever crewed spaceflight to polar orbit aboard SpaceX's Crew Dragon. Long March making two outings to orbit, three Starlink launches that contributed towards SpaceX's achievement of now having launched three quarters as many Starlink V2 satellites as V1, NASA officially added Starship to its launch roster, and much, much more. Enjoy. In last Monday's episode of Space This Week, I discussed the likelihood of SpaceX selecting previously flown and caught Soup Heavy 14 for Starship Flight 9 instead of using Booster 16, which is the next brand new fully assembled Soup Heavy, which completed cryogenic testing on the 28th of February. Well, it's now all but confirmed that SpaceX will indeed refly Booster 14 for Flight 9 because of the fact that the booster was rolled down to orbital launch pad A, placed on the pad, and then proceeded to conduct a static fire test with all 33 engines igniting successfully. A huge milestone for SpaceX in reaching their goal of full reusability of the Starship Super Heavy vehicle. They've stated that their goal is to eventually be able to catch the booster, place it on the pad, refuel it, and then just launch again. And in that regard, Booster 14 isn't quite there yet. Four out of its 33 engines have had to be replaced for one reason or another, but to be honest, the program is still early days, and 29 out of 33 engines being flight proven is still seriously impressive. How do you think Booster 14 will do? Just as successful as it was during Flight 7? Or do you think it'll hit any snags during the flight? Let me know what you think below. I think the more pressing matter for Flight 9 will be trying to get Starship V2 to actually reach Apogee. The first and second flight of Starship V2, aka the only other outings of it, ended with long of multiple engines and the vehicle itself. Something particularly worrying considering the eventual repeatable successful deorbit and landings of Starship V1. I am really rooting for third times the charm with Starship V2. If the vehicle fails again, then I think it's safe to say that there is something deeply, seriously, chronically wrong with its design. I'd love to hear your thoughts below. So far, Ship 35 has completed three rounds of cryo testing at Massey's on the 11th and 12th of March, and is currently either awaiting engine install or is in the process of. While FCC permits hint at a possible attempt of a catch of Ship 35, this is exceptionally unlikely given the failures of Flight 7 and 8. Instead, we're expecting the vehicle to attempt a soft landing in the ocean from a suborbital trajectory, as was the plan for Flight 7 and 8. No confirmation has been set regarding the fate of Booster 14, but the source that initially leaked that SpaceX would refly it for Flight 9, something that turned out to be correct, also stated that SpaceX wouldn't attempt a second catch, instead letting it splash down in the Gulf of Mexico, where it'll presumably be scuttled. All very exciting stuff for Starship, but it's still a prototype vehicle, with no hard and fast contracts awarded to it yet, aside from HLS I guess. But a major step was made last Monday, when NASA announced that it had officially added Starship to its launch services roster under the Launch Services 2 contract, which means that it's now eligible for NASA missions through to 2032. This of course marks a significant step for Starship's use after it leaves the prototype phase and enters operational status. Even though Starship has flown eight test missions since 2023, it hasn't yet achieved orbit or deployed payload. However, its lack of orbit has always been one of technicality, in that it could have reached orbit, but SpaceX always ensured it never quite made it, so that if it failed to relight its engines to deorbit itself, it would just naturally re-enter and not leave itself as one massive chunk of space junk. That being said, Flight Test 7 and 8, which flew the newest generation of Starship upper stage, ended in failure during ascent, which is pretty bad, considering how successful the first gen Starship flight tests were. But NASA seems undeterred, as they officially selected the Lunar Star ship to land astronauts on the moon for the Artemis 3 mission in 2027. Me personally, 2027 seems optimistically close, and B, I have no doubt SpaceX will eventually get Starship operational, at least in a payload to orbit sense, even if the full reusability proves a persistent issue. I also don't think this is coming from internal corruption by the way. SpaceX is light years ahead of competition, and Starship has the potential to be a very capable vehicle. Speaking of which, the US Department of Defense announced last week that SpaceX would be awarded $5.92 billion in launch contracts, with $5.36 billion to United Launch Alliance and $2.38 billion to Blue Origin. This was all announced last Friday as part of the Air Force's Phase 3 Lane 2 program. SpaceX's contract was for a wide range of launch services to be completed by April 2033. United Launch Alliance's was a similar contract, also extending through 2033, and Blue Origin's the same as well. I think this is fair. 
SpaceX is the cheapest launch provider, so it makes sense they get the largest share of the funding. They have 28 projected launches for the Department of Defense at a predicted average price of $212 million per launch, contrasted with ULA's projected 19 launches with an average cost of $282 million per launch. And as for Blue Origin, they're obviously the least proven launch provider, though they do have the achievement of so far having a 100% orbit success record for New Glenn, one out of one launches in total, <laughs> so it makes sense that they would be awarded a more conservative contract, being given seven launches at an average price of $341 million. Even though New Glenn is partially reusable, unlike with United Launch Alliance's Vulcan, the higher price tag here might represent an attempt to recoup the R&D costs for New Glenn. Possibly. Nobody in the public really knows what's behind these decisions a lot of the time. SpaceX's Falcon 9 Crew Dragon hosted last week's most significant orbital launch, FRAM-2, a private human spaceflight which lifted off on Tuesday from Kennedy Launch Complex 39A. The mission was financed and commanded by billionaire Chun Wang, a Chinese-born Maltese cryptocurrency investor. In addition to him, the Dragon also carried civilians Yannika Mikkelsen, a Norwegian cinematographer and film director, Rabea Roge, an electrical engineer, robotic researcher, polar scientist, and now first ever female German astronaut, and Eric Phillips, an Australian polar explorer, adventurer, and guide. This was a significant mission, not just because it was a human spaceflight, but because this was humanity's first ever human spaceflight mission to polar orbit, and the crew conducted scientific research during the flight's three and a half day runtime from an apogee of 413 kilometers, or 257 miles, and a perigee of 202 kilometers, or 126 miles. The Crew Dragon Resilience also sported the panoramic cupola attachment that first flew on Inspiration 4. Among the experiments conducted were the first ever x-ray of a human being in space space, an attempt to grow oyster mushrooms, the first time mushrooms have been grown in space, and take a series of slow-scan TV transmissions over amateur radio directed at competing educational groups. While none of these experiments required the mission's unique flight path, each of the crew members have ties with polar exploration, so if nothing else, the mission held significant personal milestones. And frankly, I was surprised it's taken this long for a human spaceflight to polar orbit, if nothing else for one nation to hold bragging rights over others, like we saw with the initial space Space race between the US and the Soviet Union. Speaking of the OG space race, Valentina Tereshkova's launch, which was the first ever human spaceflight to carry a woman to space, launched to an orbital inclination of 65 degrees, which until Fram 2 held the record for highest orbital inclination. Another first for Fram 2 came in the form of Crew Dragon's first ever splashdown in the Pacific Ocean. Cargo Dragon used to splash down in the Pacific, but recovery operations were later shifted to the East Coast in order to make it easier to return astronauts and critical cargo to the Kennedy Space Center, since that's also on the East Coast. However, it turned out that the Dragon's trunk module, jettisoned just before re-entry, wasn't always completely destroyed upon atmospheric re-entry, and debris was being found on the ground after the fact. And so now things have been reverted back to Pacific Ocean splashdowns, so that any surviving debris crashes in the ocean close to Point Nemo where any impact is extremely unlikely to cause any damage. Fram 2 wasn't Falcon 9's only outing last week. In addition to that, we also saw three Starlink launches on Monday, Friday, and Sunday. Monday's launching from Kennedy Pad 40, Friday's launching from Vandenberg, and Sunday's launch from Kennedy Pad 40 again. Monday's launch carried 28 Starlink satellites to orbit, Friday's launch 27, and Sunday's carrying 28 again, bringing last week's total to a whopping 83 Starlinks launched. All Falcon 9 first stages were successfully recovered, and with these launches, SpaceX has now placed three quarters as many V2 mini satellites into orbit as V1 and V1.5, massively upping the bandwidth of the Starlink constellation. China was once again no slouch when it came to orbital launches. We saw two missions last week, starting with Tuesday's Long March 2D launch, which carried four communication satellites from the Chuen Satellite Launch Center. A significant launch, as for the first time, the rocket utilized a 3.8 meter payload fairing. Official sources haven't been too open about the payloads for this mission, other than confirm they reached their planned orbit successfully, and that they will primarily be used to conduct technical verification and experiments, including mobile to satellite broadband connections and the integration of space ground networks, so probably part of China's ongoing efforts to create their own version of SpaceX's Starlink. 
The other launch we saw from China was a Long March 6, lifting off on Thursday from the Taiyuan Satellite Launch Center, carrying the Tianping 3A02 satellite to low Earth orbit, where it'll assist with the calibration of ground-based radar equipment. In addition to this, official sources also stated that it'll support imaging experiments for ground-based optical equipment and monitoring tests of the low orbit space environment, while also providing services for atmospheric space environment measurement and orbital prediction model correction. Lown Aerospace was back in action twice last week. On Tuesday, I continued my April tradition of playing RSS to try and satisfy the many requests that I do so, featuring RSS veteran Beardy Penguin to guide me along. And then, on Saturday, I visited the Oceans of Eve as I recreated my first ever KSP YouTube mission on the exact 10-year anniversary of that video's publication. Man, crazy how time has flown by. Thank you all so much for the support over these 10 years, and hey, even if you haven't been around all this time, thank you for being a supporter of my work right now, especially if you made it this far into the video. And of course, huge thanks are owed to the people on the right. They make all this content possible by supporting on Patreon and through my YouTube members program, so sincere thank you if you're one of those names. But that's the end of today's episode of Space This Week. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you on Saturday for another Kerbal Space Program outing. Enjoy.